So this morning, I want to talk about baptismal promises. I want to ask some questions. And maybe we're even going to talk about the end of the world. I mean, talk about the end of the world. We won't get to the end of the world because we got football today. So, because you got priorities. Okay. But as you just heard Isabel read, we are going to start with Noah's Ark today. What we want to do is we want to take over the next nine months, go through the Bible. And we're going to spend the next four or five months going through Old Testament stuff and dealing with some of these stories. And then about Christmas time, what we will do is we will switch to the Gospel of Matthew and go in-depth in the life of Jesus. And what I want to do today is start out this story with Noah's Ark. And the interesting thing is often when we talk Noah's Ark, we tend to go like this. Uh, if you can see this, this is a stuffed ark toy. Um, my mother gave this to our sons when they were little. And as you can see, we've always got the cute little giraffes. Uh, and everybody's got their head out the window. I think get a little fresh air. It's got to get a little stuffy in the ark after a while. But it's like it's some law that every child's nursery has to have a Noah's Ark. It has to have something with the cute and fuzzy things. And there's always the giraffes with their eyes sticking out over the top of the ark like they're looking for land. And I want to ask you, why do you think that is over a story where God says, everybody has become so corrupt and so bad, we're going to wipe out all of humanity except for eight people and we turn it into a children's toy. My hunch, my thought, my theory, is that when things get so terrible, when stories become so overwhelming, we put it in this kind of a format so we don't have to deal with the implications. Some things just get so overwhelming so we just shy away from them. And we turn it into this brightly colored thing where everything's happy and you get these neat stories and these happy anthropomorphic animals because we don't want to deal with what's really going on. Now, I do want to take just a second here as a little counterpoint. And some of you who are thinking, oh, wait a minute, I love the story of Noah's Ark and I love to get into the details. And maybe you're from a little more biblical literist camp. And you love to study exactly the dimensions of the ark and how the geography and the geology point to there having been a flood X number of years ago. I want to caution you because sometimes I'm afraid that we use that study as another way of distancing ourselves from the story. Another way of saying we don't have to deal with it. It's like we get so wrapped up on what the paper is made of, we don't read the words of the story. So let's take a look at what happened. We're starting in Genesis. And Genesis is this interesting book. And whether you have been here forever and you know the Bible backwards and forwards or you have never been in church before, our goal always is that wherever you find yourself on that spectrum, you should find something challenging and thought-provoking and comforting in these messages. So if you've been through the Bible a number of times, you know that the first 11 chapters of Genesis is all these big world-spanning stories. Creation, Adam and Eve, the fall of humanity, Noah's Ark, and the Tower of Babel. And then in chapters 11 and 12, it focuses down on one family, and that's what we'll pick up next week. But for today, in 6, 7, and 8, we get this crazy story of Noah. See, what happens in 6, as you just heard Isabel read, is God says humanity has become so corrupt, so vile. God says, I regret having made them. And so God says, you know what? I'm going to wipe out everybody except for Noah and his family. 
And he says, Noah, you and your wife and your three sons and their wives, I want you on the boat and build this giant boat and have two of every kind of animals. And so Noah builds the boat. And then the floodwaters come. And everybody except for Noah's family drowns. And after a while, the floodwaters recede. And the boat lands. And Noah comes out with his family. And he builds an altar and he makes a sacrifice to God. And God says two things. I'm never going to destroy the world like that again. And remember, you're made in my image. So what does this mean? I want to start out with some questions and see what questions this story asks us. I was sitting down with the high schoolers a couple of months ago, and we were having this great discussion, and they asked this question, why doesn't God just make everybody good? And it's one of those questions that has been around for a long time. And I think on some level, we've all asked that question at one point or another. Why doesn't God just make everybody good? Because, I mean, here you've got God saying, I'm just going to wipe out everybody except for these eight people. Wouldn't it have been better or easier for God to say, I'm going to make everybody do what they're supposed to do? Well, let's explore that for a second. Let's do a little thought experiment. Pretend for a second you've got a child. Some of you are like, yeah, I have one of those, but I don't want to talk about it. And others of you are like, no, I'm fine. Okay, just work with me here for a minute. Pretend you have a kid, or imagine the kid you have. And that child is a normal human being, and sometimes they listen, and sometimes they don't. But what if I gave you an app for your phone? And there was a button on that app where you could make them eat their vegetables. You could make them go to bed on time. And maybe even there was a giant button that made them love you. Now, what happens if you hit that button that makes them love you? Do they really love you? Or are you just making them love you? It's an interesting question, isn't it? You see, the thing is, when God created us, what he says at the very beginning of Genesis and then reiterates in this narrative is we're made in his image. And one of the many things that that means is that we have free will. We have the ability to do good. We have the ability to do bad. We have the ability to follow God or to walk away from God. It's all those choices. And so when God says, I am going to give you free will, I am going to make you like myself, I'm going to make you in my own image, he is giving us the ability to walk away from him and say, I don't want to love you. See, the thing is, though, God always wants us to be following him. God always wants what's best for us. But sometimes we can't see that. Which brings me to my next point. The next thing the story asks us is how do we feel about the people who aren't on the ark? See, we so often get focused on this beautiful image, God saving this one family and all these animals. And we see Noah there on the seas looking out for dry land, sending out doves to see if anything is out there yet. And we don't ever think about the people who didn't make it on the boat. It's one of those things, as I've been working through this passage, as I was working through this this week, 
it really just struck me how much we miss that. And we often do this thing as Christians where we're like, we're so happy to be in the ark. We're so happy to be in the church. We're so happy to be saved. And we're like, oh, that's right. There's people who aren't. And sometimes we're like, oh, yeah, they should find Jesus too. But more or less what we often do is this little thing where it's like, well, we're going to go to heaven, and if you want to come, you can come too. And if you don't, that's cool too. And that's not who we're called to be. How do you think Noah felt about the people he knew who drowned? But the people he knew who didn't get invited on the ark. Kind of one of those things where it might be like, yeah, I didn't like you, but I didn't want you to drown. You see, friends, we're called to love those people. Love those people who are outside. Share with them who Jesus is. One of my profound regrets, one of the things that I often think about is back when I was in Toledo, when I was starting out in ministry, I had this sleepy little congregation. And I had a little bit of time. And so what I did is I developed a relationship with a couple of the local funeral homes. And so when somebody died who wanted a Christian funeral but didn't have any church connection, they would call me. And it was always interesting because the person who died didn't have any connection to a church because otherwise they would have gone to their church or their church would have had that funeral. And none of the family members had connections to a church because if they did, they would have gone to that church for a funeral. But instead they called me. And so I always felt like I was in this thing where it was like, okay, I'm here because you want a Christian funeral and that none of you are really connected to a church or Christianity. And so I was always happy to go and talk and be with the family and do the best I could. But I look back at that and I know through my own inexperience and my own immaturity, it's like I know I could have done a better job. And I wish I had done a better job in those situations of saying, this is who Jesus is and this is why Jesus loves you. Come be saved. And it's one of our calls as a congregation to be part of this community and love the people around us and say, we want you to be loved and we want you to know how much Jesus loves you. It's a call to a new life to call to a new hope. Now, as long as we're on the subject of regrets, let me take that and pick up that thread and move on a little farther. One of the things you see a lot in literature and storytellers explore this whole idea. If you have painful memories or something that just left you scarred, and you could erase the memory, would you? Why doesn't God just take away those painful memories? And I think a lot about some of those experiences for me. And I haven't suffered real trauma, but I've had my share of setbacks. And the question is if I could erase those memories, would I? And I don't think I would. And I suspect most of us here wouldn't. Because we know on some level they're part of what shaped us. Part of what 
made us who we are. And this story of God wiping out everybody, it's part of our story. It's part of God saying, you know what? This was bad, but I'm never going to do it again. I'm never going to wipe out all of humanity again. And this is on this path, this road to Jesus dying on the cross for us. It is through God's work and God's path and God's plan. The idea being that nobody perishes. That's the hope, that nobody perishes. There's this interesting thing. 500 years ago, Martin Luther was rewriting the story or the service for baptism. And one of the things he did was he rewrote this baptismal prayer. And these are the words he wrote to be said over the baptismal font. You're not getting baptized today. You're looking at me like you want to, though. Okay, that is an adorable child. <laughs> All right. All right. So Martin Luther wrote these words. According to your eternal, excuse me, almighty and eternal God, according to your strict judgment, you condemned the unbelieving world through the flood. Yet according to your mercy, you preserved believing Noah and his family. Eight souls in all. You drowned hard-hearted Pharaoh and all his hosts in the Red Sea. You led your people Israel through the water of dry ground, prefiguring the washing of your holy baptism. Through baptism in the Jordan, your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, you sanctified and instituted all waters to be a blessed flood, a lavish washing away of sin. We pray that you would behold this child according to your boundless mercy and bless him with the true faith and the Holy Spirit that through this saving flood, all sin in him, which has been inherited from Adam and which he himself has committed, would since be drowned and dry. Amen. It's a beautiful prayer and a reminder that these waters... The waters of baptism are echoed by the waters of the flood. The waters of the Red Sea, of the River Jordan. It's all brought together in one thing of God redeeming us, saving us, and bringing us to new life. And so as you go through this week, meditate on this. Consider it. And see what God is asking you in this story that you are a part of. Amen. If you please stand.